And Magic called me and said, hey, I need your help. I need a ride. I have a friend who hurt himself, and we need to go to the hospital together. Now, one of the last things I thought I would ever be doing in the Middle East was making hospital visits. So, but I said, well, Magid, if you think we can get in, we'll go to the hospital. So Magid, I went, drove across town, picked Magid up, and we went to visit Musa. Musa had been working on a roof that day, and there was a hole in the roof that dropped about two stories, and Musa had fell, fallen through that hole and had broken his collarbone. Musa had been taken across town and was having surgery, and I thought, well, we're, Magid and I are going to be the only people visiting him, and I don't even know how we're going to get in. I, I don't know if Magid knows how we're going to get in. We're just going to go over there. So we walk in the hospital, and Magid knew what room Musa's family was in, and so we began making our way through the hospital. There was nobody to stop us or anything, and when we got to the room, Musa wasn't in there. Musa was still in surgery, and they just let us in the room. Well, when I arrived, the room was full. It's a two-person room, and half the room... Half the room was uh, a couple, their family, sitting over there quietly. And the other half of the room was Majid and his friends that were working in the country at the time. And they were all gathered together there, about 19 in total. So like 16, 17 of your closest, imagine, 16 or 17 of your closest friends and one American dude that is there in your room. Now... In America, usually when you come out of surgery and they've knocked you out, you go to a room with a nurse and they sit you there. I don't know if you, you're aware of that. They sit you there and the nurse watches you wake up and she makes sure you're doing okay or they make sure you're doing okay and then they bring you to your room with your waiting family. That's not the way they do it in the Middle East. They just roll you right out of surgery whenever they're done and shove you back in the room. So just for your imagination, Imagine waking up from surgery, the first thing you see, again, 16, 17, 18 of your closest friends watching you come to, and one American standing there looking at you. The great thing about this is, is Majid does not know how to be calm and somber. He loves to laugh, and he le thinks the best thing for you anytime is to make you laugh. Now, Arabs love company, and they love company all the time, but Majid at this point started telling jokes. And so Musa has a broken collarbone, and they've got his arm positioned however they were, have positioned his arm after surgery, and they don't give a lot of pain medication. And so Majid begins and tries to make Musa laugh. And Musa's just wincing in pain, just trying to not laugh at Majid this whole time. The, all the rest of us were having a great time listening to Majid. It was a great show. But the thing about this is, is that point, you would think, man, I would hate to have that happen. As a matter of fact, I have told Majid he is not allowed to come visit me if I ever have surgery in the Middle East. It is not, I don't want to laugh. I don't want to see him. But the truth of the matter is, is for an Arab, the worst thing in the world that could happen to you is to be alone. To be alone at the most difficult time, in a time of surgery, to be there by yourself would be horrible. And so when Musa came to, even though he didn't like to laugh, he was happy to have his friends with him sitting there. In Syria today, would you take a look at the person next to you? Just look. If you were a Syrian today, one of you, one of the two of you would not be going home tonight. One in two people are displaced from their home, either inside the country or outside the country. There's millions and millions of people around the globe spread out from a Syrian war that's been going off for 11 years. And that idea of somebody sitting with them in a time of difficulty, their friends, their friends are in just as but rough case, rough shape as they are, and there's no one to sit with them and comfort them. They're by themselves. The opportunity to minister, to come alongside, to show the love of God to them is wide open. As we worked, as we, as we lived there, we had started a Bible study. And as we came around to have the second round of Bible study, I, I was helping, but I was not in charge of gathering people to be in the Bible study. And we gathered a group of people, and Amber and I went into the Bible study, and we were sitting there with people, and we started watching them. And as we were watching them, we started, and the, this Bible study is about 14 books of discipleship. So you start just as you become a believer, and you work through basic truths 
of Christian doctrine, and you learn these things. And so we were sitting there, and we knew a lot of the people in the room, but there was one lady that we didn't, didn't know. We'll call her Hannah this morning. And we didn't know Hannah, and Hannah was sitting there, and uh, we didn't know her. We didn't actually know her name at the time, and we started this Bible study. And Hannah came. She was faithful there every week, but Hannah just did not agree with the things that we're saying. The first little lessons, the number of lessons there about salvation, about grace, how that we're sinners and that our sin bears consequences, that the wages of our, our sin is death, but Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins and that by faith through his grace we can be saved and have a home in heaven to be brought back into fellowship with, with God. And she was listening to these lessons and you could tell she was just not on board with them. And Amber and I were sitting with each other, and we watched week after week, and we said, Amber, we need to figure out who this person is. Who's Hannah? Well, Amber went digging a little bit, found out that Hannah was there. She'd been coming for a little while. But Hannah, Hannah did some things during the week. She actually went to the local mosque, and during the weekdays, she would sit in the local mosque and teach women Islam. She was an apologist for Islam, and she would sit in the yard there at the mosque and teach ladies as much as she could. And she was coming to our discipleship Bible study. She was attending our discipleship Bible study. And we said, oh, this could be interesting. This is, this is not exactly the way this is supposed to work. But Hannah came and she was faithful. And what, what happened is we watched and Hannah's attitude began to change. What happened is combative in the beginning, as distant in the beginning, she began studying the Bible she been hearing it every week. What she was at one time asking hard questions and asking things controversially, she began answering questions from Scripture that she had read and she had studied. This was at a time when Amber was expecting joy and joy was coming along and we had to leave the country and we had to walk out of that class and leave it. And after a while, as that class continued, as they continued teaching those things, we come to find out that Hannah had actually stopped being combative and just stopped not just studying, but she had accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior. She became a believer in that class. And not only she did, did she do that, she began to teach. She was studying the Bible, and she began teaching Bible doctrines in the class. She, she would be the most diligent student in the class teaching those things. And as I went back to visit, as I, I returned and to see those things, I saw Hannah, and she was joining in worship. She was meeting with the church. She was coming together and praying together. But Hannah also was baptized. She took a public profession of faith, something that you don't always do in the Middle East because of the dangers associated with it. Hannah, Hannah the next time that class went on, she, she took the first couple classes as we encouraged everyone who went through discipleship to do, to teach the first couple of classes about salvation to the next generation, to start a pattern of teaching somebody else, training others also. And Hannah began teaching the next generation of believer the basic doctrines of our faith. As we talk about the Great Commission, as we talk about the things that God is doing in the world today and how we are given a command to participate, to go into all the world, to preach the gospel to every creature. We think about the Great Commission. We think about reproducing that over and over again, not just here, but around the world. If you would look at, if you would look at, at statistics today, if you would look at what people survey and say, they would, they would look at Christians today and talk, I'm thankful for this church of speaking of the Great Commission regularly, quarterly, speaking about faith promise and our responsibility to get to the gospel to every creature. But statistics would tell us that 50% of people who are Christians, who are believers, who are disciples, would not know that they have a command, that they have a responsibility to get the gospel to the nations. Another percentage of them would say they don't know what that actually means, what the Great Commission actually means. They would have, 50% would have never heard of it, and a percentage more would say, I don't know what that means. And sometimes I wonder if it's for us who hear it all the time, if it's not a matter of not knowing, it's more a matter of not realizing. 
what's going on. Before we get started, I'd like to ask the men in here, specifically husbands. Gentlemen, have you ever been sitting at home minding your own business on the couch watching TV? Maybe you got your favorite ball game on, football, basketball, whatever, whatever, whatever your sport. Maybe you're fishing or golf. I don't know what it is. You're sitting on the couch. You are doing nothing, and you are good at it. Yes, it's great, right? All right, there, we're awake, good, there. And your wife, your wife walks into the room with you as you are doing nothing, and she says to you, what do you think? And you go, oh, no. What do I think? I haven't even noticed. What is it? And you look at her. You go, I think her hair's the same color it's always been. It's the same length. I've seen that dress before. That's not it. The shoes are the same. What am I missing? This was a good day. It was... It was, it was going to be great. What, what am I missing? And so often, we just don't notice, right? And today, we're dealing with a group of men who just didn't notice. In John chapter number four, if you have your Bibles today, we're going to read some scripture together, and we're going to walk through a passage of scripture. I hope that you'll walk with me through this passage Walk with me with Jesus and his disciples as we walk through this chapter. I love John chapter number four. If you are a Bible teacher, a Sunday school teacher, a preacher, if you're serving and you don't have two or three or four or five or six lessons out of John chapter number four, you need to go back and look at it a couple more times because there's a, so much stuff in this passage We'll begin reading at verse number one. Would you look at me, look with me in verse number one. It says, when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again unto Galilee. He must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. I want you to see this picture. Jesus, Jesus is ministering in Jerusalem. He's ministering in the south there, and he's working, doing these things there. And John the Baptist at this time had had a ministry that was drawing people. John was often ministering down by the river in desert country, and people were coming out of Jerusalem, out of the cities, and they were gathering to him. And he had made a lot of noise. He had drawn a lot of attention. There were people who were coming to him. He was busy all the time. There were converts. He had not only drawn the attention of the The common people, but the religious people had noticed John the Baptist at the river preaching. Not only that, the king, the the people in charge had taken notice because John had said some things condemning them for their actions. And John is there and everybody knows who John the Baptist is. And Jesus, it is said here, realizes. He realizes that the Pharisees had heard that he was making more disciples. He was baptizing more people than John. That comes to his attention. Now, I want you to notice something very interesting here is Jesus is ministering. He has gathered men to himself. We call them the disciples. These men are gathered around Jesus. They have learned of him. They were, are taking lessons from him. And we find out in John chapter number four that these men not only have learned something, they not only have been trained a little bit, they have been put to work. And they're not just moving chairs. They're not just doing things like that. They're baptizing people. The people who are expressing their belief in Jesus are coming to these disciples. And the disciples are aiding them in making this public display 
of their faith in Jesus. That's what the disciples are doing here. They're not novices. They've been trained enough in ministry. And what happens is Jesus finds out that people know something's going on where he's ministering. And so what does he do? Does he, does he act like we do today? You know, he takes out his, his camera and jumps on Instagram and goes, hey, blessed. Is that, that what he, is that what he said? No. He does quite the opposite. He packs up his bags and he moves. Jesus is not distracted by the success or the knowledge or the idea of success. He's not distracted by what's going on there. He acts in purpose. And on purpose, Jesus leaves Jerusalem. And scripture tells us here, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee in verse number three. In verse number four, it tells us something about his journey. If Jesus was around today, he would have taken his phone out. He'd have opened Google Maps. He'd have typed in, well, I'm in Jerusalem. I need to go to Galilee. He'd have typed that in, and Google would have come up and put a road right straight up and down. There's just a journey right through the heart of the, the country there, and it would have said, this is the fastest route, the most fuel efficient, and there are no toll roads on it, and he would have just walked, and you would have said, of course he had to go through there. But culture at the time was a little different. If you were a teacher, if you were a rabbi, if you were somebody who was religious, there was a little problem that happened right in the middle of that journey, and it was the Samaritans. And the Samaritans were a group of people, you know, they were the leftovers that got left in the land, and they had taken their, some liberty with religion, they had taken some liberty with the rules, they had taken some liberty with how they thought about things, and so they were these people they, they were just, they didn't follow the Jewish rules, they didn't follow the Jew, Jewish customs, they didn't worship in the right place, and they were out there in the middle. And if you were a rabbi at the time, if you were a, a Pharisee at the time, in all probability, you would have taken that alternate gray route that was on Google Maps, right? You'd have just said, ah, oh, here's another route. The problem was it wasn't faster, it was a long journey, you would often leave Jerusalem, kind of go down by Jericho. If you, if you have a map in the Bible, back of your Bible or, or some other time, use some other time to go, to go home. Go home later on and look at the map. You kind of go down to Jerusalem, down towards the Dead Sea, and you'd cross over the river down by the Dead Sea, and then you'd walk up what's called the King's Highway north towards Galilee. And when you got to the north, you'd cross back over into Galilee from Decapolis, and you'd be where you needed to go, and you did not have to mess with those pesky Samaritans. Now, if that didn't work, the other option was get up really early in the morning, pack all the food you need, and hightail it right straight through to get to Galilee as fast as you could. But Scripture tells us that Jesus, on purpose, had to go through Samaria. And he begins walking through Samaria. He and these disciples are walking with him. They would have left early in the morning. We find out that he shows up at the well at Sychar at noon. The sixth hour of the Jewish day is noon. Now, noontime at this point, walking through these mountains, having been there, he had been walking all morning. And I can drive in a car for six hours and be worn out completely and not want to do anything. Jesus had been walking. As the sun began rising overhead, shining off the mountains and the rocks as the light not only was hitting from overhead, but was reflecting off the ground. And he was hot. And commentators would tell us that even the sheep at this time of day were finding a place to get out of the sun, to get out of the heat, to do something different. And Jesus is wearied on his journey. No doubt the disciples walking with him are also tired. But would you watch as they come to Sychar, this place of Samaritans, this place, this city of the Samaritans that Scripture tells us he had to go through. Jesus stops on purpose. He stops on purpose. And he sits down at the well, being wearied from his journey. And he stops and he waits for his disciples and he says, all right, guys, what are we doing? And Scripture tells us in verse number eight there, the disciples wanted to go buy something to eat. They were hungry. So the disciples left. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had the opportunity 
And I saw Jesus sitting at a well by himself. Nobody around and nobody was showing up for a while. I want to say about myself that I would take the time and sit with him. Take the time and get some personal one-on-one teaching, right? Take the time and ask some questions about different things. But what we find out is the disciples who had been with him, who had ministered with him, who had worked with him, who were walking alongside of him, didn't care to spend any time with him. They left him at a well beside himself in a strange country. And they walked into town. Now what happens here is quite strange. These, these men, how many ever one of them said, we're going to town, we're going to buy lunch. At the same time, a woman comes from Sychar to draw water. Now I have a question for you. How, well, let's ask it this way. What time of the day do you need water? Well, I mean, the first time I hope you need water was a couple hours ago when you woke up and you needed to brush your teeth. At least, I hope you used at least a little bit of water. Probably a couple people in here had at least a cup of coffee this morning and maybe even did some dishes to clean up from a hearty breakfast that prepared you for a good day, right? You need water right at the beginning of the day. The men in here had to wash that sleep and drool off of them that they collected through the night and try to do something with their hair that was sticking up all over the place. I don't know what the ladies had to do. We're not going to talk about that. The guys had to do that. So I know you needed water. And this is noontime, and even the sheep don't want to be outside. And a lady comes from Sychar to draw water at noontime. She needed water hours ago. And yet she comes. Something else interesting about this lady, she comes alone. If we were together, a couple of us together today, a couple couples today, I don't know any of you in here. If we were to go today, go to lunch together, and we'd grab a table at a restaurant, and I said, gentlemen, I've I've got to use the restroom. I'll be right back. I'm going to wash my hands. I'll be right back. The guys would go, see you, man. Let me know where it's at. All right? If one of the ladies at the table said, oh, I have to use the restroom, every lady at the table will stand up together, and they will walk to the restroom together and use the restroom together. I I don't understand. I don't know why. What's interesting about this is that's something that hasn't changed. That's not something that's new. This lady, no doubt every house in the city needed water in the morning. No doubt multiple ladies needed to come to the well to gather water for that morning. And if there was an opportunity to do a chore together, I mean, think about it. If there's an opportunity to do a chore together, they would have been on the street, meeting in the street every morning with their water pot, and because they had to check, well, you know, have you seen the latest style over there at this store? You can get it half off over there. It's great. I heard a story the other day about this person, that person. Let me tell you about this. Not... Not gossiping, but we do it on Facebook today, right? This is the same thing we're doing on Facebook. Oh, let me post this to my, my Facebook, to my story. Let me tell everybody what's going on. It's the same thing that happened then. They would have walked together. They would have found out what the information for the day is, was. They would have went back. And this lady all by herself shows up at the well alone. Nobody else wanted to be with her. And Jesus takes a moment and he engages her. He speaks to her and he speaks to her kindly. Now, I'm sorry to do this to you, but you have homework today. Okay? You have homework. The back of your bulletin, there's two sets of passages listed at the back of your bulletin at the very top. In between those are some extra verses. Right? There's extra verses between those verses. So that starts about verse number 8, and it goes through verse number 26. Okay? So at home this week, in addition to your regular Bible study and whatever you do for your quiet time and prayer time, I I would love for you to read those verses. And I want you to look at something. 
I want you to look at how Jesus deals with this woman. Jesus was on purpose walking through here. And Jesus deals with this lady at the well in those verses gently. He deals with this lady. If you watch and you read, you'll see that every time this lady opened her mouth answering Jesus, she threw controversy at him. I was at a coffee shop in Iowa a couple weeks back. And I walked in the door and I asked for a cup of coffee and I wanted it a very certain way because I want to be able to drink my coffee directly and I like my coffee slightly cooler and I I got a response that was quite short that I can't control the temperature of your coffee. Well, do you have an ice cube? We could put an ice cube in there and try to deal with this. But when I get answered, when I have a response from somebody, my usual response is to turn away I don't want any problems. I'm going to walk away from this conversation. And as you read this week, as you read these passages with this lady, as Jesus is dealing with her, he is gentle. He is gracious with her. She brings up controversy of politics, of culture, of religion. She makes fun of him. She is sarcastic. Read it. You find out how Jesus is consistently dealing with her. He walks his way on purpose with a, through a conversation with a hostile lady. And in the end, he shows this lady who he is, the Messiah. And he brings her to himself. It's an amazing story. You should read it this week and study it and think about it, meditate on it. But we're not looking at that lady today. We're looking at the disciples. Would you look with me at verse number 27? As Jesus says, I that speak to you am he in verse number 26. Verse 27 says, and upon this the dis- his disciples returned. Upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, what seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? Jesus is on purpose dealing with this woman. He left Jerusalem from a successful ministry. He walked through the heat of the day. He stopped and stayed by himself. He dealt with the circumstances of the heat. He walked through all of these things. He dealt with the the sarcasm and the, the controversy that this lady threw at him. And the disciples return, all of that on purpose. The disciples return and they see him, they look at him, they look at what Jesus is doing. They're dealing with this situation and they look at it and they think to themselves, eh. Right? You didn't didn't see that in there. Eh. No one cared to ask what was going on. Can you imagine? They didn't ask Jesus why he was speaking to the lady. They didn't care enough about the lady to find out if they could help her. There was nothing there, nothing in their eyes, nothing in their minds that said, we need to figure out this situation. We need to know what was going on. We need to figure these things out. And what happens is at just that time, the lady walks away. Verse number 31 says, in the meanwhile, his disciples said, pray, eat. But he says unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Verse 33 says, therefore said the disciples one to another, hath any man brought him anything to eat? His disciples had gone into town to buy lunch. Would you pause for a moment and think about that? Here's a place that these men have never been in all probability. They've never been to Sychar. There's 12 of them. Can you imagine getting 12 of these guys to make a suggestion on where they want to eat? Can you get them on the same page of what they want to 
like, what guy? What do you want to eat? I don't care. Whatever you want. They, they, and they walk into town that way. They get to town. They've never been there before, so they they don't have any knowledge of what's going on in town. So they walk in and they have to find a place to eat. They walk through the gate. They walk into town. They're seeing people along the way, and the people they come across, the place that they eat is the restaurant that's on the front street, the grocery store that's the most prominent there, the bakery that's there, the fruit stand that's right there. Whatever they've done, if they happen to get a meal at one of those places, if they have to gather food, maybe meat from one place and vegetables and bread and things from other places, as they walk through and find the supplies that they need, they could only deal with the most prominent and well-to-do people in the whole town, because that's what they saw. They didn't know about the deals that were around back in the alleyway where that guy can get his fruit and vegetables cheap. And they dealt with the men of the city, these businessmen, these successful businessmen. They walk in, no doubt making a roar. There's 12 Jews that are walking into a city of Sychar that Jews don't have anything to do with. There was noise going on. Something is happening here. Who are these guys? Why are they here? Where's their master? And no one sees. Nothing is said. They turn around and they come back out. They see this lady who's speaking to their master. They see this lady who's dealing with him. They don't ask any questions. They let her walk away. And they look at Jesus and say, eat, eat. He says, I have, I have food that you don't know about. And I want you to notice how slow these men are. They go, was Grubhub out here? Like, is DoorDash going on in Sidecar these days? I don't remember that. They didn't notice. They didn't ask any questions. They had one thing on their mind. They were worried about one thing, and that was lunch. That was the only thing they had on their mind, lunch. What their stomach was saying to them. To satisfy the need of their body, their flesh, that was the only thing on their mind. Even with their master stopping, even with their master dealing with somebody, even with their master speaking and giving prompts, they thought about lunch. Jesus says to them, my motivation, my desire, my sustenance, my food is something different than you've been concerned about all day. And he begins speaking to them about this. Verse number, would you continue with me in verse 34? It says, and Jesus said unto them, my meat, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Say ye not, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto eternal life, both that he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is the saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap, whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye entered into their labors. Can I draw your attention to this one phrase that Jesus says to his disciples? Would you lift up your eyes and look? Jesus on purpose left, and he walked, and he labored, and he he was kind and gentle on purpose. And these men, these disciples who were following along with him walked through the day alongside of their master with their heads down, with one concern on their hearts and their minds, and that was lunch. And 
how often today we as disciples, where we would say, man, I'm so much better than these 12 men that Jesus called and walked with him. I would never do that. I would never miss those things. I would never do those things. How many of us live a life that our focus and our desires, the things that wake us up in the morning, the things that we go to bed thinking about at night are nothing more. They're just as temporal. They're just as 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 earthly as the lunch these men were thinking about. These men ate a meal that that they would have in the middle of the day. They ate something. They were sustained for a number of hours, and they went home, probably couldn't tell you what happened with it, what they had in Sychar. What was that meal like you had in Sychar in Samaria? I don't remember. That was lunch. I've had five of those, six of those this week. And I'm not saying lunch and food is wrong or bad, but when it is our only focus, when we keep our eyes not on the world, not on the things around us, not on what God is doing, but we put our eyes on our own hands and our own desires and our own things, and we live life day after day motivated by lunch, we're doing nothing more than these men did in this passage. Jesus gives us insight to living with lifted eyes. He gives us insight on how he was living. Would you watch? He says here, my meat, my food is to do the will of him that sent me. He lived on purpose. He lived with purpose to do the will of his father. We mention, we speak, we, we deal with these things, talking about the Great Commission. We talk about these ideas of getting the gospel to the ends of the earth, to, to preaching the truth of God's word to the uttermost. Jesus said, my will is, the, my desire, my meat is to do the will of the Father. To seek and to save that which is lost. That's what keeps me going. And how often do we sacrifice the eternal on the altar of the temporal? We take something that will last forever, something that is the will of God the Father, something the will of him who saved us, that bought us, that purchased our life with his own blood. We take that purpose and sacrifice it. Or something that's no better than lunch. Would you notice that he not only talked about the will of God the Father. He, he makes a statement here. He, he talks about on to finish his work. How often do we say we, we speak of the great commission... We speak of the Great Commission, we speak of missions, we speak of the gospel going to the ends of the earth, and we, have, we don't have God's goal in mind. Well, I'm going to look like I'm doing something here. I'm going to participate. We act as though, in the end, we deal with this, this idea that finishing is not an option, that finishing is not the goal, that there's not something that we're aiming for, that we just have to look busy. We just have to fit in with the people around us. We don't have to do any more or any less than those around us. And yet God has placed things in our hand. God has placed unique gifts in our lives. Jesus here says, my goal, my meat, the thing that keeps me going, the thing that keeps me moving from place to place, the thing that pushes me forward that, quite frankly, makes me leave a place of blessing and move to a place of sorrow, of difficulty, is there's a work to complete. There's something to do that's greater than what has been done in the past, and we have to move forward. We have to not just keep time, not just look like we're working, not just give lip service to what is being done, but to move forward. 
Jesus gives us insight into the lives of these men. He says, don't say there are yet three months and then comes the harvest. He says, lift up your eyes now. He prompts them. He prompts them to the work that God has for us to do. We are given an insight into the heart of these men. These men, no doubt, said, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really ready to do ministry in Sychar. You know, this, this, is not really, this is not really what I've been given to do. Sychar's, Sychar's not where I'm supposed to. I, I like Galilee. I mean, I fished in Galilee. I know those people. I can minister in Galilee. I'm not, I hadn't been with Jesus long enough to minister. I hadn't done these things. I, I need some more time. Three months, but I, you know, if I hung out with Jesus a little bit longer, if I was a little bit stronger disciple, if I'd learned a little bit more, maybe then I'd be ready to do this work of living with lifted eyes. Maybe I'd put my eyes on the needs around us. Jesus said now he prompted them to move. How often do we say, I, now's not the time. Man, I've got, I've got kids right now. I've got bills right now. I've got work right now. I don't have any kids right now. I, don't have, a, I have health issues right now. I have this, I have that, I have that. And we make excuses on why now is not the time. Give me three months at work and this project will be done and we'll be good to go. Give me two months and school will be done. Or give me three months and school, first semester will be done. And I can get back to work. And Jesus says, now's the time to lift up your eyes. Would you notice there's a partnership? There's a partnership. Jesus looks at the men and says, you went into a place. I, I'm, there's people who sow and there's people who reap. You're not expected to do all of it, but you're expected to be in on it. You're not expected to do everything. You're not Superman, but you're expected to do something. There's a partnership. There are people who have gone before you in prepared soil. There's people who've gone before you and they've sowed seed. There's people who have gone before you and watered. There's harvest to be done now because there's a partnership to have. Quite frankly, we're all gifted differently. Each of us have a unique gifting that God has given us. We will see the work of God. We will see the work of God completed when we live in partnership, serving alongside of our brothers and sisters for the purpose that God has given. Lift up your eyes. Would you notice just, just in closing, two things, two things about this passage of scripture. Jesus is sitting with his disciples. He's sitting there. The woman has come. You can see it there. Verse 28, the woman then left her water pot. A moment with Jesus changed her purpose on life. She came to the well for one reason, and that was human temporary things, and she left on a different mission. And she went into the city and saith unto the men, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is this not the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. It is said, Jesus sitting there with his disciples, his disciples having come from the city, the woman having gone back to the city, do you imagine with me as Jesus is sitting there speaking to his disciples? Samaritans, by, scholars tell us, wore white garments was how they worshiped. Today, if you, there's a few Samaritans left, and on their days of worship, they're dressed in solid white. Can you imagine the picture as Jesus is sitting there dealing with his disciples? Would you lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white unto harvest? And he could turn those men around and point them back to the city that they just walked out of. 
that they had just made an uproar in just by who they were. The place that they had gone and met the most influential men of the city. Would you look and lift up your eyes for the fields are white unto harvest. And the Samaritans were coming because of the testimony of a woman that had been with Jesus. Would you lift up your eyes? Would you look? One last thing. Verse 38. Look at that first couple of phrases there. Jesus says to them, I sent you to reap. The disciples went to the city to buy lunch. Jesus sent them to reap. Jesus sent them on purpose, and they missed it. The men who came out of that city that Jesus was able to preach to were there and prepared for his disciples. I sent you to reap a harvest that was already ready. And God has sent us into a world, to a people. We have been sent. We have been commissioned to go. As I have been sent, so send I you with authority and power to speak the word of God. I ask you this morning, are you living with lifted eyes?